Hey everybody, welcome back to Computer Science 4303. Today we're talking about Assignment 2, finally our first game in the game programming course. Um, so in the last two lectures we talked about our entities, components, and systems. Then in the previous lecture we talked about our entity manager and a little bit of game math. And now in Assignment 2 we're going to put all of that to use. So. Uh, welcome, and I hope you enjoy the actual start of programming games in this class, because I certainly am. Uh, just as a quick uh, update, I had some questions about the grades in the course, so let me just hop over here. This is the, um, the, the assignment grading scheme for the course, and some people were worried that the assignments were worth, like, too much. Uh, so someone said, oh, I'm not, I don't feel very confident with assignment one, and it's worth 12%. Well, the way that D2L works is that there's a category called assignments and that that category is worth 50% and then assignment one is worth 12% of this category. So assignment one is not 12% of the year, it's 12% of 50% of the year. So that's how that works, okay? And similarly with the project, um, the final project per, like submission is 70% of 50% of the year. Okay, so that's how those categories work um, with the assignments. So just make make sure you understand that that like assignment one is actually 6%, assignment two is 12%, assignment three is 18%, etc. So I just wanted to get that out of the way because there were a few people who were confused about the, um, the grading scheme. All right, so let's have a look at Assignment th two, shall we? All right, let me hop over here. I'll just start by actually running the game because I think that's the best way to do it. So uh, let me put this on there. I'm gonna run the game full screen so that you can see it a bit better. Here we go. So here is assignment two. We are making a game that I'm calling a Geometry Wars clone because Geometry Wars is a game that I have played and based this off of. So the player, is this rotating red shape over here. And then we've got other shapes that are spawning every so often. And I can click with my mouse to fire a bullet. And then that bullet is going to somehow destroy those enemies. Um, you can see here that the enemies are gonna take some shapes. We've got, it looks like we've got some regular sided polygons and those polygons are um, gonna be drawn with a randomized color. And as I get hit by things, my player is going to spawn back in the middle of the, um, of the arena here, if you will. So when I get hit, I spawn back in the arena. Uh, it's, it's getting a little bit hectic right now. So let me turn down the spawn rate by going into my config file. And the enemies are going to be spawning every this many frames. So let's turn that to say, 180 so instead of one per second we're going to get one every three seconds that'll be a bit less hectic for the explanation there we go so every three seconds now we're going to have an enemy spawning in our game so you can see here that as i shoot something it's going to break off into a bunch of smaller enemies and then they're going to fade out and eventually not be there anymore similarly with my bullets if i click you can see that my bullet fades out and eventually doesn't exist anymore and uh, every time I hit something, my score goes up. So I have a score, that score goes up based on how many things that I've hit. So let me kill some things here. There we go, we'll clear off the board a little bit. You can see that my bullets fire toward the mouse. All right, here we go. The only other thing in the game is that uh, shapes bounce off the sides, okay? The bigger shapes bounce off the sides. And I can also have what I'm calling a special weapon. So you are going to make your own special weapon in the game. Here I've got this sort of over overpowered fire in every direction uh, weapon. And that's about it. So the game looks very, very simple because it is. Um, however, it's going to be made even more simple by the fact that we're using entities, components, and systems. So you can see here that we've got a number of things. We've got some collisions between bullets and enemies. We've got some collisions between enemies and the player. We've got collisions between the enemies and the walls. We've got some drawing of shapes. We've got um, the spawning of enemies. We've got lots of different cool things that we're doing in this assignment. Okay, so that's just a brief demo of the assignment. We'll come back to that as we need it. 
Um, but first, I just have a few slides uh, to explain the overall uh, architecture of the assignment. And then I'll open up the uh, config file. And the config file will, will explain exactly what we need um, to do for the assignment. And then I'll open up the code and we'll show you what, uh, where you need to put things for the assignment. And I'll do a couple of little examples. So let's do the uh, PowerPoint first and I'll get that loaded up right now. Okay, so lecture number seven, assignment two, engine architecture. And then after this, I'll explain um, the actual code of assignment two. So our engine architecture progression is going to be ongoing throughout the entirety of this course. So if you're out there and you know a lot about game engine programming, or you know a lot about ECS or like low level efficiency and stuff, just be aware that this is not the final architecture for our assignment. We are learning as we go. So the way we're doing this is assignment one. We had sort of a getting used to C++ and the SS SFML API. Um, we had all of our functionality in main.cpp. I wouldn't really call, well, you know, assignment one was a very, very simple game architecture that basically just consisted of a main loop, right? We had a while loop, it looped forever, we could do things, we could draw things, that was about it. In assignment two, now we are going to start actually having a game engine or something we could maybe call a game engine where we are going to separate the functionality of different things into different classes. So assignment one, we had everything in main.cpp and in assignment two, we're going to have classes that serve their own functions. Um, we are going to write our own VEC2 class for 2D game math. We did basically that in the last assignment or in the last lecture, but in this assignment, you are going to be finishing off that VEC2 class and adding whatever functionality you want. Um, we are going to see these ECS classes start to appear and I'll go over those with you when we open up the code. We're going to have an entity manager and that entity manager is going to handle all of our entity data. And the ECS systems are going to be in a game class. So we're going to have a game class. It's going to handle most of the things uh, related to game mechanics and each of our systems is going to be a function inside the game class. So this is assignment two. It's by no means a complete game engine architecture, but it is a stepping stone to our next game engine architecture. So here's what that sort of look, looks like in a UML diagram. So, uh, and I know that my UML diagrams are not necessarily the, the most accurate diagrams, but it's just, you know, for illustrative purposes. So over here, we are going to have our game class. We're going to have some private variables and some public member functions. Uh, we're going to have our entity manager again that stores our entities and has our public functions to be able to add add things from that entity or add things to the entity manager. We're going to have an entity class which is going to have a number of components stored in it as well as its tag, um, whether or not it's active and its ID. We're going to have oh over here my face is hiding it, but this is the vec2 class. We are going to have um, a bunch of operators on that VEC2 class, and we are going to have our um, component classes as well. So we might have a transform, score, collision, etc. So this is essentially the architecture for assignment two. Our game class is going to store an entity manager. The entity manager is going to store the entities, and the entities are going to store components. So as we remembered, from last time, uh, the VEC2 class, this is going to be our 2D math structure. It's going to have an X and a Y component. Um, we're going to have our components for this uh, course. They're going to be pure data. The components are stored within the entity class and each component has its own class. And the idea here, if you recall back to our ECS lecture, um, each each of these components is going to implement some intuitive entity feature. So for example, the transform is going to have the P, the, the position and the velocity and stuff like that. The score is going to store the score. The entity, um, again, anything in the game is an entity. It's going to store um, shared pointers to our components. We are going to have um, an entity type. So for example, we could have the player, we could have a tile, we could have an enemy. Those are going to have types and that's stored as the tag. This active Boolean is whether or not uh, the entity is currently alive or dead. The ID, that's the integer identifier to be able to say whether or not, you know, okay, is this the same entity as another entity? 
And over here, I have a pointer here. So that in the UML diagram, I'm saying that these are raw pointers, but that's just shorthand because I don't have enough space here to write standard shared pointer. But this is a standard shared pointer for assignment two. The entity manager, this is our factory class. Um, we are implementing delayed entity add. We talked about that in the last um, lecture. That helps cure iterator invalidation. We have a secondary map um, from tag to entity. So we're trading storage for convenience and time. And we're also, we could do other bookkeeping in here um, as well. And in the game class, this is something that we haven't talked about yet. It's the top level game object. And I'm gonna be going into detail about this when I start to open up the code. Um, this is the top level game object that holds all of the game data. So here you can see it holds the entity manager. It holds the window. Uh, we're going to have a little pointer to our player here, for example. Um, it has all the game system functions. So for example, movement, user input, rendering, enemy spawning, etc. It's going to have all the gameplay code as well. So what can this engine do? Well, the game engine can create objects as entity instances, and those come from the entity manager factory. Uh, it can add component data to entities. It can implement gameplay via systems on the game class. It can pause the game and exit the game. It can initialize the game and load it from a configuration file. So these are the things that it can do. What are the limitations of this game engine? So what are we going to do eventually that we cannot currently do? with this version of the game engine. So currently, this game engine can only display one scene, okay? So we're only looking, we're only like hopping right into gameplay. We don't have any menus or anything like that. We currently cannot load any textures or sound assets. We'll get into that in the next lecture. We cannot display any textured animations. That'll be for a future lecture. Uh, doesn't have any menu or interface. And so what did I mean by a game scene? Well, I've been talking about this a lot in the lectures. Um, here's an example. I like the Pokemon example because there's, um, it's pretty intuitive. So a game can contain many different scenes that have very different logic and controls. So for example, if you have an RPG game, maybe you have a dialogue scene where you're selecting text. You have a world map scene where you're walking around with some sort of top-down view. And then you have a combat or battle scene. And how is our architecture going to allow for these different game scenes? I said game states here, I meant uh, game scenes. Well, that's going to be in our next lecture. We're going to talk about um, how we do things like that. So that's the ar overall architecture for assignment two. We have all these classes. Here's a, here's a view of that. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to read the readme file, which explains in detail exactly what we have to do for the assignment, now that you've seen sort of what the intuition for the assignment is. And then right after that, I'm going to hop into the code, or maybe I'll be tabbing back and forth. All right, so let's get rid of this. I have already completed that. And then do, 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 we will open up the readme file. Okie doke. So let me get a bit of a darker background behind the readme file. Here we go. So here's the readme for this assignment. Um, it's pretty intuitive, but it's also pretty long. It turns out this is kind of the game design and architecture document. And so it's long because I want to give you as many checklist items as possible, right? So you can exactly know if you're going to get all your marks or not. So there's a little bit of a change in the submission for assignment two. This will be the way that we're doing things from here on outwards. So for this assignment, you will zip and submit the entire source folder of the assignment. You are not allowed to add any files in additions to the ones that are already in the source folder from the assignment zip file. This means that you will not be submitting any changes that you may have made to the Visual Studio project or the config file or anything like that. So for this assignment, you are zipping and submitting everything in the source folder and it has to be .zip. So the, um, the D2L assignment submission will only accept one file and that file has to be a zip file. And again, you have to include all of your student information at the top of the thing uh, of main.cpp. Okay, so make sure that you edit main.cpp. There'll be a place for you to uh, put in your student names uh, for your group members there. All right, so here's the program specification. 
In this assignment, you will be writing the game that was presented in class. This game must have the following features. So you saw the game already. I'll describe it now. So the player is represented by a shape, which is defined in the config file. I'm going to get to the config file at the end, so let's just leave that for now. The player spawns in the center of the screen at the beginning of the game and after it dies. So it's going to die whenever it collides with an enemy. So that means that when you launch the game, it's going to, uh, it's going to spawn in the middle of the screen. You can move around. And then when you hit an enemy, it's going to spawn back in the middle of the screen. The player moves by a speed read in from the configuration file in these directions. So you're going to have standard W, A, S, and D controls. So W, uh, up is W, left is A, down is S, and right is D. The player is confined to move only within the bounds of the window. So if you're moving up, down, left, and right, and you hit the side of the window, then you just hit the side of the window and you, and you don't go beyond that. The player will shoot a bullet toward the mouse pointer when the left mouse button is clicked. The speed, size, and lifespan, we'll get into lifespan in a little bit, of bullets are read from the configuration file. So that's the player. That's how the player is going to be implemented. Special ability. You are free to come up with your own special move, which is fired by the player when the right mouse button is clicked. This special ability, so you have free reign to come up with your own special ability, okay? But I'm putting, I'm putting some special qualifiers on it. So this is where you're going to be able to have fun with this assignment, is making a really cool special ability. And any other special effects that you want to put into this assignment, you totally can. However, you just can't put in anything that's outside the source directory. So this ability must. Um, so multiple entities or bullets must be spawned by the special weapon, okay? So when you hit the right click, it can't just be like a faster bullet. It has to be something pretty complex. So you could have uh, a flamethrower or something like that if you want to. You could have like an atomic bomb that like hits the, the whole screen, whatever. Um, entities must have some unique graphic associated with them. So when you spawn something, make it look as cool as you can. Some unique game mechanic is introduced via a new component. So this means that you are going to add a new component to the components file, and you're going to add that new component to the entity, and then um, your special weapon is going to use that new component somehow. So for example, one special weapon that was made uh, in a previous iteration of the course that I really liked was like a gravity well. So you fired, uh, like a, they fired um, a bullet toward a location, and when it reached there, it started sucking in other entities, right? And so this had a gravity component, and other entities would read that gravity component. Also, a cooldown timer must be implemented for the special weapon. So that special weapon must have uh, a timer. So for example, you can only use this special weapon once every two seconds or something like that. You can't just spam that special ability. Um, the properties of the special move are not in the configuration file, so you have to put that all into code, okay? All right, so that's the player, and that is the special ability. Enemies. Enemies are going to spawn in random locations on the screen every so many frames. Yeah, someone out there said, weren't you just spamming yours? So... With, when it comes to my assignments, it's do what I say, not what I do, right? So I wanted to, I, yeah, I don't have a cooldown on mine, but you have to have a cooldown on yours to get the marks. I've already passed the course, so you can ignore what I do. So enemies are going to spawn in a random location on the screen every X frames, where X is defined in the configuration file. We already kind of showed how that works. Enemies must not overlap the side of the screens at the time of spawn. So you're going to have to generate random locations for the enemies that are within the screen. Um, enemy shapes have a random number of vertices between a given minimum and maximum number, which is also specified in the configuration file. Enemy shape radius will be specified in the configuration file. Enemies will be given a random color upon spawning. Enemies will be given a random speed upon spawning between a minimum and maximum value in the configuration file. When an enemy reaches the edge of the window, it should bounce off in the opposite direction at the same speed. So that's very similar to assignment one. And 
The hardest part about assignment one is going to be the following. When large enemies collide with a bullet or player, they are destroyed. And n small enemies spawn in its place, where n is the number of vertices of the original enemy. Each small enemy must have the same number of vertices and color as the original enemy. These small entities travel outward at angles of fixed intervals equal to 360 divided by vertices degrees. For example, if the original enemy had six sides, the six smaller enemies will travel outwards in intervals of 360 divided by six equals 60 degrees. Um, the smaller enemies must have a radius equal to half of the uh, original entity. So what does that mean? Well, let's, let's go back and we'll run the assignment again. So if we look, in this assignment, we have um, an enemy right here. This enemy, I believe, has seven or eight sides. Oh, there we go. This one has three sides. So when I shoot this pink entity right here, it is going to spawn, well, it has three sides. So it's going to spawn three entities equally spaced out in 60 degree, or sorry, in 360 divided by six, or divided by three angles. So 360 divided by three, that's 120. So if I shoot this one, let me run it again. You'll see what happens. Uh, okay, so we're going to have this enemy spawn. There we go. So now I shoot it. You can see that three entities spawn. This one has five. Five entities are going to spawn. See, this one, seven entities are going to spawn. They have half the radius of the original entity, but they have the same color and they have the same uh, number of sides. Okay, so this is what you're going to have to implement. So if you see how that works, um, let me do that again. This one's gonna spawn into four, this one into three, this one, oops, I hit that one. This one into five, this one into six, this one into three, etc. So that's what you're going to have to implement. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Before we get on to anything else, let's talk about what, we, what we've said so far. So let's hop over to our blackboard. Okay, so there's a couple of interesting things for the geometry of this assignment. Um, okay, so I got some questions out there, but I'll answer those later because I, I want to get this answered first. So let's have a look at our window first. Here is our window. Our window is going to be a, uh, let me make this a little bit thicker. There's our window. The window is going to have some size. And just remember that up here, this is going to be 0, 0. Let me make that a bit easier to read. So up here is 0, 0. Down here is width height, right? Okay, you can all see that. I'm just looking over at my monitor. Perfect. In previous assignments, when we had circles, okay, here is a circle. We also, we, we had the position of the circle equal to, so the um, circle X, circle Y, was the top left corner of this circle, right? So our circle's position is defined by this bounding box, and the X, Y position of the circle was up here in the top left. Okay, so that was how we did assignment one, right? So assignment one, we had some circle shapes, we had some rectangle shapes, and the position of that shape was defined by the top left corner. Now, what we're going to want to do in this assignment is detect circle to circle collisions, okay? And uh, let me just say really quickly that even though our, um, our shapes in this assignment are different sided polygons, they are going to be represented by circles. So let me talk about circles for a bit and then I'll start telling you how we're going to do that. Um, so we're going to want to do circle circle collisions. And as we saw in the notes, circle circle collisions, we are going to want to be able to know the middle of a circle as well as the radius of a circle, right? So in order to do that, it would be really convenient if the position of our circles were instead of being specified by the top left corner was actually the middle, right? So, and how can we do this so that now 
our CX, CY is down here in the middle instead of at the top left. Well, what we could do is every single time we want to do a calculation, we could add, right? So for example, here, the distance from the middle to the outside is the radius of the circle, right? So this is the radius R. So that means that the center point of the circle would be at CX plus R, CY, oops, CX plus R, CY plus R. So if we really wanted to, we could refer to the midpoint of the circle by just adding the radius of the circle each time. But that would get super, super annoying. So what we can do in SFML is the following. We can use the set origin function. So set origin x, y. So what set origin does is it sets the place where the shape's position is within the shape. So for example, if you want to look at it like this, the origin of this shape, of this circle right now, is in the top left corner. That is where the origin is. So if I set the position, right now the position of this entity is that if we take these grid cells to be 100 each, it would be at 300 in the x direction and 200 in the y direction, right? Because we've got 300 across and 200 down. And by default, because the origin of any shape is in its top left corner, if we say set position 300, 200, it's going to move the circle so that um, 300, 200 is the top left position. But what we want is so that if we say set position 300, 200, the middle of the circle is, is at 300, 200. So the way we do that is we are going to say set origin so that it's in the middle. Okay, so now that's in the middle. And how did we do that? Well, it's really easy. We just figured that out. We are going to set origin of the circle equal to radius radius. So what that means is starting in the top left corner of the shape, we go over by radius. So we start, we, this is the, this is the X component radius, and then we go down by radius. Okay. So it just so happens that that is the middle of a circle. So now what happens is this circle, if I do this, now it's position CX, CY, is in the middle of the circle. So now the position of this circle would be at 400, 300, right? Because it's four over in the X direction and three down in the Y direction. So that means if I then have another circle and I'm trying to do the collision uh, formula, I now can just say shape.getPosition and that is my center point. That's my X and Y for the center. And then I can do the circle radius collision that I was doing last time, okay? So that's what the set origin thing does. If you think about it, um, the set origin, if I have my phone here, okay? If I say set origin in the top left, so set origin zero, zero, that's sort of where I'm picking up the shape, right? And if I put down the shape, it's at the location of my fingers, right? So if I say set origin in the middle instead, and I say set position, then the middle of my object will be at that position. And that's what we're doing here. So whenever we have a circle and we want to place it so that when we say set position, it's the middle of the circle that's going to be at that position, we use set origin and we say the middle of that shape and the middle of the circle from its top left is radius over and radius down. Perfect. All right. Now, when it comes to the actual game, you saw that there are actually polygons in the game. So instead of circles, we have polygons like this, okay? So that's a little confusing. However, here's how um, computers can't actually draw circles. What do I mean by that? Well, you say, Dave, here's a circle. Yeah, I mean, it looks like a circle, but it's not a circle. The reason it's not a circle is because if I zoom in, 
Look at this. You see all these jagged lines here? This is not a perfect circle. At some point, a computer drawing pixels to a screen has to draw a series of jagged lines. That's all it can ever do. It has to draw drag jagged lines. Now, some vector displays of years gone by could actually draw circles, but every display you're ever going to be working with is going to eventually be drawing these jagged lines. And so whenever we want to draw a circle to the screen, the computer wants to know, hey, how many lines should I use? Right? Now, for this program like Paint, it's going to have some default amount of jagged lines in order to make our eyes think it's a circle. Actually, I can still see, maybe you can't because of the compression, but I can actually still see these jagged lines. So, what happens is, when you tell a circle to draw, um, when you tell your computer to draw a circle, you're essentially saying draw a circle at some position with some radius with some number of sides. Right? And the number of sides is, is how you're going to draw that. So for example, if I start with a triangle, right? The simplest 2D shape that I can draw that is enclosed is a triangle. And so if I tell SFML to draw a circle shape, and that circle shape has three sides, that is going to be a triangle. So this, this triangle is enclosed by a circle, essentially. So it is a circle shape that is being drawn with three sides. That's what it's done. Um, someone out there is saying draw a circle. Okay, yeah, so I, I have a typo there. It's fine. You, you understand, I hope, what this is doing. If I pass, so that's what happens if I pass three in for the sides, okay? If I pass four in for the sides, you'll get this shape. If I pass five in for the sides, you'll get this shape. If I pass six in for the sides, you'll get this shape. And so if I pass, I think by default, the default for a circle in SFML is 32 sides. So it looks enough like a circle, but you can't actually pay it, you can't actually see because your eyes may not be, um, either the resolution is small enough or your eyes just can't see that it's actually 32 really straight lines. So it's kind of cool that we get to be able to draw all of these shapes for free just by specifying the number of sides in a circle shape. So let me really quickly, um, I'm over here Googling SFML. So SFML, okay, so I am at the SFML website. If I click on learn, there's going to be the uh, tutorials. If I come down here to shapes, then look at this. So this is a circle shape, okay? So how are we going to define a circle shape? Well, we already kind of talked about this. Um, so SF circle shape, it's going to be 50. We can set an out, uh, a fill color of the circle. We can set an outline thickness of the, um, of the shape. We're gonna talk about that in a bit when we get to the programming. An outline color, that's all part of this assignment. Um, we could set a texture if we want but there is a part set point count. So the point count of a circle is the number of points that it is drawn with that I just said. So that's the number of sides. And if we want to make a triangle, we can just say SF circle shape, this is the radius and this is the number of sides. Define a square, circle shape, square, I know that sounds weird, um, with uh, this radius and this number of sides. Okay, so an octagon would just have eight sides. So in our assignment, you're going to be using this to draw regular polygons with a given radius. However, even though you are going to be drawing a triangle, for example, the way that two shapes collide, the bounding box, just to make it easier for you, is going to be the circle that encloses that shape. Okay, so if you have one triangle over here, and you have one triangle over here, then they are actually, I know this isn't touching exactly. So right here, these two shapes are going to be colliding right now, okay? So this shape is touching this shape when the circles enclosing them are touching, even though those triangles are not actually touching yet, 
Okay, see how that works? And we're going to kind of, uh, it might look weird right here, but in the assignment, we're going to give everything a rotation so that you kind of can't see that happening, right? Like the number of shapes, like it kind of still looked like that touched properly, but it's not touching like exactly properly. It's the circle shapes that are enclosing the shapes that are actually colliding. So if you get real close, maybe you can see that it's not exact, but it's good enough for our assignment, okay? So that's what I mean by, um, by the circle shapes enclosing uh, a shape. So if I have a triangle shape and I say get radius, even though a triangle doesn't have a radius, it is the radius of the enclosing circle. So that's what is given to you by the, the by this triangle's radius, okay? All right, uh, the last thing that was said here in the assignment is what happens when an enemy is hit. So if we have a, let's say, hexagon that is going to be hit by a bullet. So we have a bullet, that bullet comes in, the bullet collides, boom. What's going to happen? Well, the first thing that happens is that the bullet gets destroyed, then the shape gets destroyed. But what I'm going to do is I am going to mark the middle of this shape with a tiny, teeny circle. Okay. So there we go. And what's going to happen is essentially, however many sides it has, I'm going to chop up a circle into that many directions. And those are going to be the directions that my circle or that my smaller entities are going to go in. So if I have six sides, like I have right here, then I have 360 degrees in a circle. I have six sides. So the angle is going to be equal to 360 divided by six equals 60 degrees. So if I move this over here just a little bit. So right here, I have the angle in here is 60 degrees. The angle right here is 60 degrees. The angle right here is 60 degrees. Now it turns out that when you're using most graphics libraries, the zero degree, so zero degrees is right here. Okay, it's along the X axis. So if I erase all of this for a second and I say, okay, my shape gets disappeared. If this right here was the middle of that original entity, well, I'm going to essentially be shooting something out in this direction. That's 60 degrees or that's zero degrees, then 60 degrees, then 120 degrees, then 180 degrees, then 240, 300, and then that's the six directions. And what's going to happen is I am going to, for each of these six directions, starting in the middle, right? So I'm going to start in the middle. I'm going to be spawning six smaller things, each with six sides. And the first one is going to go out in this, in this direction. The second one is going to go in this direction. Third one in this direction, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Okay. So that is how we calculate that. So for example, um, this one is going to be going out in this direction, right? So this is going to be going out from here. So it spawned here. It's going to be going out in this direction. So if this is zero degrees and this right here is 60 degrees, right? So you have to figure out the X and Y change at each frame. So this is given a speed, right? So the speed is how far I want it to go every frame. That's going to be given to you in the assignment um, configuration. So if I have a speed right here and I have an angle, what is the X, Y vector update per frame? Well, we went over that in the previous lecture, so I don't have to do it here, okay? So you're given an angle and you're given a speed, find the X, Y update. That's what you have to do for this. Similarly, uh, so, so that's what that's what happens when entities explode. They, they explode into however many entities that they had sides. The other thing that you have to do is you are going to have a player 
in your game, right? Here's my player. Uh, let me make that just a little, I guess, nicer. And you are going to be firing a bullet wherever the mouse is. So let's say our mouse is over here. The bullet is going to go from the center of the player. It's going to spawn at the center of the player and it's going to travel in the direction where you clicked. So here what you have is you have the player X and the player Y. You have the mouse X and the mouse Y and you are going to be given a speed. And you have to figure, uh, you have to calculate what the update velocity is of this bullet and so how far it should go on every frame, okay? So just keep in mind that if I tell you uh, that this bullet should travel at a speed of five, it doesn't mean that it's going five in the X direction and five in the Y direction. It means that it, I want it to travel five pixels here on every frame. So on say frame 20, it was here and frame 21, it was here. And that distance is five. So if this distance is five, you need to figure out somehow using the math that we had in the slides, how far in the X direction and in the Y direction that it should be moving on every frame. Okay, so that's up to you for this assignment. So that's the bullet firing as well. Okay, so let's go back to the readme file because I think we have covered all the math for everything so far. Let's go back and we'll do this. So yeah, that was the spawning of the enemies, the drawing of enemies with a particular number of shapes. Uh, oh, one more thing. Back to the blackboard. One more thing is the spawning of the enemies. So here we have, uh, let me use a better thing. Okay, so let's say that we have spawned a circle, right? And this circle has a given radius R. So this is the radius of the circle. You have to generate a random number, okay? So random between zero and width for the X. So the when whenever these shapes spawn, you are giving them a random position within this window, okay? That's, that's the specification. So z the X value for this shape is going to be a random between zero and width, and the Y is going to be random between zero and height. Now, we talked about last time how to generate random numbers between a range, but look at this. This circle here, the position of this circle is the middle. So if I said generate between zero and width, I could have a shape that actually spawns overlapping the sides. So what you have to do here is instead of generating a random between zero and width, you have to say X is random between, well, zero plus, plus radius, width minus radius. So what you've done there is if radius here is 100, you've sort of gotten this, um, this imaginary boundary within your window so that shapes like this one cannot actually spawn overlapping the original side, okay? So you've gotten this like zero plus radius. So this radius here, you can't spawn inside there. So you can't overlap with the side. And similarly, your Y is going to be like Y equals random from uh, zero plus radius to height minus radius. Okay, so that's how you make sure that you things spawn um, inside the inside the window without overlapping the window. Okay, back here. All right, so let's keep moving on with the assignment description. Score, so there's a score as well. Each time an enemy spawns, it is given a score component of n times 100, where n is the number of vertices that it has. Small enemies get double this value. So that means that small enemies are going to be given n times 200. Uh, if a player bullet kills an enemy, the game score is increased by the score component of the enemy killed. So each enemy, each enemy entity is going to have a score and whenever you kill one, you read that score and you add it to your current score. The score should be displayed with the font specified by the config file in the top left corner of the screen. All right, that's pretty simple. 
drawing. In the rendering system, all entities should be given a slow rotation, making the game look a little bit nicer. So you can just say rotate an enemy every like uh, some number of degrees every frame. That's not specified for you. Um, someone said, do we have to prevent shapes from spawning on top of us? Uh, if it's in the, so if it's here in the assignment file, you have to do it. If it's not, then you don't have to do it. Okay. So if you want to do that, you totally can, but I don't think that I've specified that, but that's a very good question. So no, you don't have to make sure that you don't spawn on top of us, but if you were making a good game, you probably do want to do something like that. Any special effects which do not alter gameplay can be added for up to 5% bonus marks on the assignment. Note that assignments cannot go above 100% total marks, but the 5% bonus can overwrite marks that you lost in on any other areas of the assignment. So that just means that, you know, if, if you want to go crazy with this and add some bonus features, you can get um, bonus marks for those. Another very important thing, any entity with a lifespan is currently alive. So there's a new, there's a component um, in this assignment called a lifespan. And a lifespan is essentially just a timer, okay? So it's saying that um, it's essentially how long it has left to live. So any entity with a lifespan is currently alive. Um, it should have its color alpha channel set to a ratio depending on how long it has left to live. So again, let me just look at this. So load up the assignment. When I fire a bullet, you can see it kind of fades out. So a bullet is going to have some lifespan. The lifespan is measured in frames. And what it says is when that many frames have passed, when I have been alive for that many frames, I'm going to be destroyed. And it allows you to do cool effects like bullets that don't travel forever or small entities that don't travel forever. Here you can see that those small entities are also given this lifespan. So that lifespan uh, says, for example, if an entity has a 100 frame lifespan, that means that as soon as it's created, a timer starts ticking and at a hundred frames, it's going to disappear. Okay. If it has a hundred frame lifespan and it has been alive for 50 frames, it's alpha value should be set to, well, 50 divided by hundred is 0 0.5. The maximum alpha is 255. So it's 0 0.5 times 255. The alpha should go from 255 when it first spawned to zero on the last frame when it was alive or the last frame that it's alive. Okay. So it should go from fully opaque to fully transparent over that ratio, over that duration. Uh, here's some miscellaneous stuff. The P key should pause the game. So what does that look like? If I press P, let me uh, spawn an entity here. The P key pauses the game. See that? So everything is paused. Game is paused. All right. So you have to implement that pausing, which is pretty cool. Um, the escape key should close the game. So you're going to put that in the, uh, in the event handler. All right. So that's the description. Now let's look at the configuration file. So just like assignment one, you had a configuration file. This assignment configuration file is very, very, very similar. You read it in the same way. However, the things just mean something different. So the very first thing, let's have a look at the configuration file. Here we go. So we're going to have five lines. It's going to be window, font, player, enemy, and bullet. And all of these things just specify the, the properties of, of those things. So let me do this so I can have both open at once. So window, this line declares that the SFML window must be constructed with width W and height H, each of will which be integers, each of which will be integers. FL is the frame limit that the, wim the window should be set to and FS an integer which specifies whether or not the dis to display the application in full screen mode or not. Okay. So down here, if this was a one that my game is going to launch in full screen mode, and I'm not going to do that here because, um, it messes with my OBS settings. But if you do go to the, um, SFML tutorial, and you have opening and managing a window down here, uh, 
full screen is a style that you can set on a window. And so you can just look here and you can see how to, um, how to set up a full screen window. So that's the window. That's, that's very, very simple. You've basically already done that. Again, a font. Um, this is the font file, the size, and the RGB. You did that in assignment one. Here is the player specification. So the player specification is going to have first the shape radius. So this is an integer um, representing the radius. The shape radius is going to be different from the collision radius. So what does that mean? Well, let's go back to the blackboard for a second. I could have a shape that is this big, but collides with things with this radius. So for example, if there was another shape, oh, sorry, that's not a very color, colorblind. Um, so this right here, uh, do, do, do. this value is the shape radius, SR, and this value is the collision radius, CR. And so if I have another shape out here, it will collide right now at the collision radius, not at the shape radius, okay? So if I come down here to my, um, configuration file, if I set, so this is currently the shape radius of the player. This is the collision radius. So if I set the collision radius to be twice as large, and then I run my game again, then it will be colliding with things before it gets to my player. Watch. See, it was out a bit before it collided with it. So it looks kind of strange, but that is an option that I want you to have, and you're going to have to implement that. And I'll show you, it's going to be very simple how you implement that. So that's the collision radius. Here is the speed. That is the number of pixels per frame I want this thing to travel. So that speed, again, is a magnitude. It's not S in both the X and Y directions. You have to figure out, that's the hypotenuse of the triangle that you have to figure out the X and Y from that. Um, it's given a fill color. So F, R, F, G, F, B, that's the R, G, B of the fill. This is the outline color, O, R, O, G, O, B. The outline thickness is OT and the number of shape vertices is V, okay? So the player by default has eight vertices. Next is the enemy specification. The enemy specification uh, has a shape radius and a collision radius, just like the player. It has one extra thing, which is uh, S min and S max. S min is the minimum speed, okay, that the enemy could have. And S max is the maximum speed that an enemy can have. And so you're going to generate a random number between S min and S max, and that is going to be the speed for this enemy. Uh, you're given an outline color and an outline thickness. You are not given a fill color for enemies because remember, those enemies are given a random RGB color when they spawn. You are given a V min and a V max, meaning that Enemies can spawn with a minimum of this many vertices and a maximum of this many vertices. So down here, currently by default, uh, the minimum is a three and the maximum is an eight. And so that means when an enemy spawns, it spawns randomly between a triangle and an octagon. Next, you have L. That is the um, lifespan of the small enemies. Okay, so that's how long small enemies are going to last when they spawn. And SI is the spawn interval, meaning that every this many frames, I am going to be spawning an enemy. So if that is set to 60, then one enemy is going to spawn every second. If that's set to 600, then one enemy is going to spawn every 600 or uh, every 10 seconds. Okay. And the very last thing is the bullet specification. So the bullet specification is very similar to the other things. We've got a speed. We've got a fill color, an outline color, uh, an outline thickness, a number of uh, vertices, and a lifespan, okay? So if this lifespan, currently it's set to one and a half seconds. If I set this to, for example, let's set it to 30 and see what happens. So my bullets should last for half a second. So if I shoot a bullet, it's, it's on the screen for much less time, okay? Also, if I set my bullet 
Uh, let's say I set its shape and collision radius to 100. Well, now the game's a little bit easier, <laughs> right? So this is why we specify things in a config file, because as programmers, uh, we want this data, like the game designers should be the ones to, to determine um, that sort of thing, not the programmers. However, we give the designers of the game um, the tools to be able to do that. So this is like sort of data oriented design. Everything is going to be specified in these config files or everything that we 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 want the the designers to have control over anyway. Alrighty, so that's what you have to do for the assignment. I know it sounds like a lot and it is a lot of programming. However, none of it is super complicated. All right, the hardest thing might be remembering trig, um, but you can just look at the uh, the code for that. All right, so here is how I recommend doing this assignment because there are a number of things. First and foremost, when writing an assignment that has this amount of work, what I have seen um, in the past is some people who are unfamiliar with, or let's not say unfamiliar, that's kind of fair. People who have not yet written projects of this size, right? Or assignments of this size. This might be the largest assignment you've ever done because I know that my assignments are, are larger than most, but it's the entirety of the course's assignments, right? So what I've seen some people do in the past is a very easy trap to fall into where you see, okay, here's a bunch of um, steps that you have to do to do the assignment. So people will sit down they will start writing code. They will implement number one, implement number two, implement number three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and they'll write 500 lines of code, and then they'll hit compile for the very first time. And if you do that, you're going to have a very, very, very bad time. Because especially in C++, when you have a lot of errors, the compiler messages are going to be bad and you're not, maybe you're not going to know where your errors are coming from. So what I'm going to tell you is going to be very important for all of your programming going forward is that you implement one of these things and then somehow you test it. Implement and test, implement and test. And you absolutely never go to the next step until you have tested that the previous step works. So by the time you get to step number six, you are not touching number six until step five, four, three, two, and one are all working and you have tested all of them, okay? Because some people write 500 lines of code, then they hit compile, they have no idea what's going on, and then they ask me what's wrong. And I certainly can't help you debug 500 lines of code, um, nor should I, right? So just keep in mind that you have to take this sort of iterated implement and test approach to this assignment and all future assignments. But the good thing is, is that there is an order in which you can do things that I've specified for you in which you can test things, all right? So for example, the very first thing you're going to do is implement the VEC2 class because the VEC2 class is how you are going to be um, storing all of your positions and stuff for the rest of the class. So, um, for the rest of the course. So if this doesn't work, nothing else is going to work. So you can implement the functions for the VEC2 class and then in your main function, you can actually go ahead and test that. So let's look at step one first and then I'll talk about the rest of the steps. So over here, this is your assignment. And I know that I realize this is a bit a uh, small font over here, so I apologize. Let me close everything up here. So this is what it's going to look like when you open your uh, solution file. Now, for some people, this solution explorer is going to be over here on the right-hand side, sort of under where my head is, but I have it over here on the left because that's what I'm used to, and my camera's up in the top right. So over here, you're going to see that there are a number of different files in this assignment. There are a number of different classes in this assignment. So for example, here's the main function. The main function is going to look, wow, this is really, really simple. And it's because we have encapsulated all of our game functionality into classes. And so all we have to do to run our game is call game. So we set up a new game 
This is the game class. That game G, that's our variable name. And we're going to pass in the config file as the argument to that. And then we call g.run. So look at how nice and neat this is, right? So we have game G, here's the config file, and then run. So set up a game, run the game. That's pretty nice, right? We'll get into that and how that works a little bit later. First, let's look at the vec2 class. So the vec2 class is here, and this is the header file. So all of our classes are split between header files and implementation files. So the header file is the .h file, and the implementation file is the .cpp file. Let me make this font a little bigger for you. So let's look at the vec2 class. I talked about this last time, um, and I did, a, I did a couple of these functions for you already. So in the vec2 class, you are going to have a default constructor. You have a, a constructor with um, x and y in. Um, in the slides, I said this is double, but this is actually going to be float. You're going to have an equals operator. You're going to have a not equals operator. You're going to have plus, minus, divide, and multiply. You are going to have um, plus equals, minus equals, times equals, divide equals, and distance. So these are the things that you're going to need to have for this assignment. If you want to have something in here, so for example, if you want to be able to normalize this at vec2, you can do this as well. So you could have a function called normalize, and then you go over. So let's, let's see how I would do something like that. So to add a new function from a header file into a header file and a CPP file, so here I have void normalize. Normalizing this vector um, would change its, well, first of all, okay, let's have a length. So length is going to return a float and here we go. So let's say I wanted to have a function called length. It's giving me a warning right now and it's saying that, okay, here's my declaration for length but I can't find the actual function anywhere. So the function meaning the definition. So over here in vec2, this is where all of my functions, my definitions actually live. You can see right now, all they do is return false or return zero or do nothing. So if I wanted to have a, a length function on my vector, wh what I could do over here is now I have to add this to the header file like so. And so here is what where the length function is going to be. So whenever you have a function which is split up into a header file and a definitions or implementation file, however you want to call it, the CPP file, you have the declaration of the function of the class inside the header file. And then you have the definition specifying which class it's in, right, um, in the CPP file. So again, that, that's how we're going to do this. So let's just look at, for example, uh, the equals operator. So the equals operator, when I, I want to implement this, so I'll go back over here and I'll find it in this function, uh, in the CPP uh, file. So I'll do one function for you. So how am I going to tell whether or not one vector is equal to another vector? Well, equality of two vectors is going to be if um, the X and Y components of both of the vectors are identical. So if I actually want to, um, to do this, I can just say, well, I'm going to return true if the X's and the Y's are the same and false otherwise. So I'm going to return uh, X equal RHS dot X and Y equals RHS dot Y. That's it. And this. That's this function. That's all you have to do. Um, for Let me do one more for you. For multiply, so this is the multiply, and what this is going to do is it's going to take in a float value, and we're going to multiply each x and y by the value. So this is x times val, and this is y times val, and then return a new vec2 based on that. That's it. It's pretty easy. Right? So this is what you're going to do. For each of the functions inside vec2, you are going to implement all of those functions. Okay? That's it. 
So let's undo what I just did and I'll undo what I just did there. So like I said, if you want to add new functions on the VEC2, you are free to do so. However, you just can't create new files. That's it. So that's the VEC2. And if you want to, actually, let me do a plus here. So let me just implement plus so I can test something. So up here, I'm going to have plus. So plus, I'm going to return x plus rhs dot x and y plus rhs dot y. Now, I said what you should do is implement this and then test it. So what you can do is go back over here to main. Okay. And well, let's run and see what we get first. So when you get your assignment, basically, again, not much is going to be working. This is what you get when you get your assignment. So let's first test this by testing our VEC2. So it's actually going to be running in a window. So this is what you're going to be seeing. And if you use standard C out, which you can do to test things, it will be over here um, in your console output. And I think that I can make this font bigger. I certainly can. So let me make that a little bit bigger. So in order to test whether or not my VEC2 is working properly, let's do that here. So I can say VEC2 V1, and I'm going to give that 100, 100. VEC2 V2, maybe 300 and 500. And then VEC2 uh, V3 is going to be equal to V1 plus V2. So then I'm going to standard C out. Oh, I, do, I have not included IO stream. I need to do that. So standard C out V3.x and then a space and then V3.y and then a new line. So this is what you should do to make sure that your VEC2 works. So if my plus operator is working, I should see 400, 600 printed out to that console window. And I do, here's 400, 600. So I know that the plus operator is working. Now, if I subtract these instead, what's going to be printed out? Oh look, zero, zero is printed out. That is not correct. And the reason it's not correct is because I have not yet implemented subtraction and that always returns zero, zero. So do one thing, then test it. Do one thing, then test it. Do one thing, then test it. All right. Okay. So here we go. Where was I? Sorry, it's hard to keep all this in my head. Then what we're going to do is implement the basic functionality in the entity manager class. Okay, before I get to that, let me show you these classes. Um, there was a question out here, I think. Okay, so someone just made a comment. Thank you for the nice comment. Um, it wasn't a question. Okay, so let's have a look over here. First thing we're going to look at is the entity class. Okay, so we're gonna go from the ground up and we're gonna look at the entity class. This is just like it was in the slides. So we're going to have uh, an entity. It has a private constructor, so we cannot construct entities on our own. It's going to have the three variables that we talked about. If you're unfamiliar with what's going on in the entity class, go back and look at the previous lecture where we designed it, okay? So it's going to have the active, ID, and tag. It's going to have all of these public pointers to standard shared pointers of the components, right? So we have the components, the transform, the shape, the collision, etc. Uh, and we're going to have private member access variables. So you can get the tag, you can get the ID, you can get whether or not it's active, and you can destroy the entity if you want to. So we went over all of the design of that entity in the last uh, lecture. Now let's look at the components. So these are the components. They each have their own class, okay? They're essentially structs, so they all have public member data, and they have no extra functionality on them. Let's look at the transform. So the transform is going to have three things. The, the transform component has the position, the X, Y position. It has the velocity, so the X, Y velocity, and it has an angle. And this is the angle that it's currently turning at, okay? So, so that's how it's, um, it's going to be drawn. So C transform, this is the constructor. 
it's going to take in um, a position, a velocity, and an angle, and then it's going to set those things. So the only logic that we ever have in our components is constructor logic to help us set this data. That's it. So that's the transform. The transform talks about where an entity is, how fast it's going, etc. Next, we have the shape component. So every entity is going to have some sort of shape, right? And so in here, we have the circle shape. So the only data that's stored here is the SF circle shape for the component. So here we have a constructor. This, con this constructor is a little bit long. Let me just split that into two lines for, the, um, for this purpose. So our constructor is going to take in a radius, a number of points, a fill color, an outline color, and a thickness. And then all we do here in the constructor is we set all of that data within the SF circle shape. So I've given you all this. So all the component stuff is already done for you. Um, the skeleton code is there. It's all filled out. You, have, you don't have to worry about that. So, so far we have a transform component and a shape component. Next, we have a collision component. So the collision component is the radius of colliding, right? So all we need to worry about for the collision for circles is the radius. So this collision component is going to be given a radius and then we store that radius, that's it. Next, we have a score component. So when a new entity is constructed, we give it a score component and that's the number of sides times 100 if it's a large entity or the number of sides times 200 if it's a small entity. We also have a lifespan. The lifespan is essentially the number of time remaining on the lifespan. Um, so what we have for assignment one is we have two values here, okay? So we're going to need to store the total lifespan of an entity, and we're also going to need to store how much time is remaining for that entity, right? So that means whenever we construct a lifespan component, we pass it in the total. So, so let's say, for example, we have a lifespan of 100. So we get a new, so we, we construct a lifespan component, we pass in 100. The remaining time at time of construction is going to be 100, and the total time is going to be 100. Every frame of the game, we can simply remove one from the, total, from the time remaining, and when it hits zero, we're done. That's it. It's really, really simple to implement lifespan. An input component. So the other component is input. And so this input component is going to store whether or not we are currently pressing specific keys. Okay. And if something has an in, excuse me, if something has an input component, then we are going to control it with the keyboard. Pretty easy. So for all of these components, we have, uh, we're storing at most one of these inside our entity, okay? And by default, all of these things will be null, and when we set one, it'll be there, okay? So um, that is the components. So that's components and that's entities. Now, if we look over here, we have the game class. The game class has all this stuff at the top. Uh, I'll talk about that in a bit but the game class stores all of the stuff relevant to the game. So for example, the game class stores the window variable. That is the SFML window. It stores the entity manager. It stores the font and the text that we're going to be using to draw to the screen. It stores the score, the current frame, the last time we spawned an enemy, whether or not we're paused, when or, whether or not we're still running the game. Uh, I'll talk about these in a little bit. Um, we're going to store, for convenience sake, a pointer to the player. And then we've got all of our systems here. So we've got an initializing function that reads in stuff from the configuration file, whether or not um, we're paused. We've got the movement system, user input system, lifespan system, rendering system, enemy spawning system, collision system, and we've got some helper functions down here. The uh, public functions, all we have is run. So everything is private. We don't want anyone from outside to be able to call these functions. And so we've got all this, all these systems and then we just call run. All right, so let's look into the game class 
And now we'll see like what this code actually looks like. So here we've got just um, similar to assignment one, we have an init function, okay? So in the init function, you are going to read in the variables. So in here, you're going to open up this path that is the config file. So if I can do, I guess, a little bit of coding for you just to help you get started. All right. Now you shouldn't do the config file till the end, but I'm going to show you how you would do it. So here we're going to have a standard input file stream, just like we had before. Let's call that F in on path done. Okay. Um, why is this? Oh, I don't have F stream included. So include F stream. We have to do that up here. So now I have this and now I can read in from this config file. Now it says here to use the pre-made player config, enemy config, and bullet config variables. What does that mean? Well, if you look here, you've got a lot of different variables that you're reading in, right? And you had these in assignment one as well. So in order to make this easier on you, so you don't have to create variables of all of these for yourself, what I have done is I have created these structs up here. Structs are essentially, essentially public classes. And inside these structs, I've created all the variables for you, okay? So in here, I've got, uh, for example, player config, I've got the shape radius, the collision radius, the like this, that, and the other thing. And inside the game class, I have created instances of these variables for you. So what does that mean? Well, let's say that I am currently reading the file and I know that I am currently right here in the file. So I have just read in this player string. And now I know that the next thing I'm going to read in is the shape radius, then the collision radius. Okay. So what I can do in here is I can say F in M player config dot shape radius, and then read in M player config dot collision radius. And then the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So by the time you're finished with all of this, you will have all of your config variables set inside of the M player config. So whenever I go to spawn the player, I can read M player config dot shape radius, and that will be the radius of my shape. So I'm going to read all of that in here once in the initialization function, and then these variables will store all of that for me. So I have to do that for the player, I have to do that for the enemy, and I have to do that for the bullet. But you can leave that for the end. That's not necessarily the first thing that you should work on. All right. In here, I have created a window with a set width and height and a set frame rate. That, of course, you also have to read in from the config file from right here. And you have to uh, make sure that if that last variable is a one, it's full screen. If it's zero, it's windowed mode. Okie doke. The next function we have is the run function. So the run function is what's called by main, right? So let's delete all of this. This is what you're going to be get. This is what you're going to get. So we're going to call the constructor. That's going to read in the config file and then run is going to be called. So how does run do everything? Well, run is going to say while the game is running, right? So this, this running variable is going to be true until we exit. I have to do a bunch of different things. So I am going to call first the entity manager update function. We'll get into that in a little bit. Okay. So entity manager, I'm going to explain, explain last. First, we're going to call the enemy spawner. That is going to spawn the enemies. Next, we call the movement system, then the collision system, then the user input system, then the rendering system. Now, what we have to do here is implement the pause functionality. So some systems should be running while we're paused and some systems shouldn't be running while we're paused. So if I come back over here and I, let's let some enemies spawn. Now I pause the game. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here. If you look, if I click, I can't shoot, if I can't move, okay? But the rendering system is still working. Nothing is moving, so the movement system isn't working. Things are still spinning. Okay, 
So I have to figure out what should be running when I'm paused and what's not running when I'm paused. So what I can do in here is I can say if uh, m or sorry if not m paused. So if the game is not paused, which of these things do I want to actually be called, right? So if it's not called, if it's not paused, maybe I should be doing movement, collision, and user input. Maybe all of these things, I'm not sure, but you'll figure it out, okay? But just make sure that, for example, I'm always rendering even if I'm paused, right? So that's how pausing works. And you can see how easy it is to implement pausing. Oops, I just searched for something. How easy it is to implement pausing now that we have our game set up into systems like this. It's trivial to implement pausing functionality. That's really cool. Okay, so that's what the what the run function does, is it just says, while I'm running, do this. And then if something sets this variable to not running, I'm not gonna be running and my game is going to close. That's it. Okay, um, the set paused function, that's super easy. You're just going to set that variable. Let me look at the spawn player function. Okay, so the spawn player function is currently I have some uh, sample code in here and I'm going to run through this sample code because by default with what you are given in this assignment, this is what happens, right? Th this is what is currently happening. Okay, so what I have done, finish adding all of the properties of the player with the correct values of the config file. So even though I have given you a sample default spawning of a player, you have to change this. What I did here is I sh I'm showing you an example of how you are, um, how you create new entities given this architecture. So the first thing to do is we create every entity by calling entity manager dot add entity with a tag. This returns a standard shared pointer to entity, so we'll just use auto to save typing. So in order to create this entity, we say auto entity equals m entities dot add entity player. So that is how we would create a player entity. Done. Give this entity a transform so that it spawns at 200, 200 with a velocity of one, one and an angle of zero. So that's how we would do this. Entity C transform. So again, it's a shared pointer. So we are use the arrow instead of the dot. And then we say standard make shared C transform. And then in here, this is the constructor arguments for C transform. So if you want to know what this specifies, you go back over to components and then you look at C transform. And here we have the constructor. So the first thing is the position. The second thing is the velocity. And the third thing is the angle. So here we're saying, give the player entity a transform of 200, 200 for the position, one, one for the speed and zero, zero for the, um, for the angle. All right, so you're gonna be just reading these in from a config file and then specifying it here. Uh, so for example, the very first thing that you'll be doing is giving the player, instead of spawning at 200, 200 up here, you want to spawn it in the middle of the screen. So let's start by, I'm going to create, I'm going to say the velocity of the player is equal to zero. Okay. Um, so that it doesn't move. So now my player does not move. Then let's try and do something for you. Let's spawn this in the middle of the screen. So you can see how to change these variables. So I'm going to say float CX. This is the center or let's middle X, middle of the screen X. How do I get the middle of the screen X? Well, I have this M window variable. That's my class variable. And I can say get size. That's get me the size of the window. Then dot X. That is the width of the window. And the middle X value is going to be that divided by 2.0 F. And I'm just converting it to a float by dividing it by a float. Similarly, if I want to get the middle y, then this is the size dot y instead. So down here where I had these um, 
these values of 200, 200, that's now going to be middle X and that's now going to be middle Y, okay? Now I, I run and now my player, my dummy player should be spawning in the middle and it is. And so that's where you want to spawn the player every single time. Cool, so look at that. We've done one of the parts of the assignment for you. So this is one of the calculations that you have to do. However, the other calculations when you spawn a player, you're going to have to, um, to, do, to do in this function. So let's just leave that as it is. Um, the entity's shape will have radius 32, eight size, dark gray fill, and a red outline and a thickness of four. So you are going to read all of these things in from the configuration file, but here I've sort of hard coded them for you, right? So what you would do here is in the initialization function, you have read in all these variables. So right here, this is the radius of the player, right? If I mouse over, uh, or sorry, if I go to components and then I look at C shape, here is the order in which I pass in these variables. It's radius, points, fill, outline, thickness. So if I come over here and I, instead of eight, I pass in three, now my player will be a triangle, right? Now it'll be a triangle. However, I want to actually read this. I've got a variable in my player config here. That's the number of vertices. So player config V, that's the number of vertices that I should be using for my player variable. So in here, what I'm going to do is once I've read everything in, instead of saying three, I'm going to have m player config dot v. That is the number of vertices. And by default, that is going to have some random value, right? Like I haven't even given it a value of zero yet, but just realize that like, oh, the radius, that is m player config dot shape radius. And once you have values into those, um, into those variables from the initialization, that's how you are going to read in those things. And then I give it the color, I give it everything else, okay? Um, then I'm going to add an input to the player, to the component, so that I can actually um, move the, the player around. And just for convenience sake, what I'm going to say is that since we want this entity to be our player, set our game's player variable to this entity. And so this goes slightly against our entity manager paradigm, but all we're doing is just for convenience and just for this assignment and for no other assignment, we have a player variable that I can refer to to just get access to my player. So that's what this is. So we are setting up that variable to be equal to this player. And I may or may not have set up all of the things for the player in this function, just to give you a sample function, but you are going to have to modify this to actually spawn a player. Now, here is where I would spawn my enemies, okay? So whenever I spawn an enemy, what I want to do is spawn them every so often, right? So. I am going to record whenever I spawn an enemy and I'm going to record that equal to the current game frame because all of my time is going to be given in frames. So enemy spawning, for example, if I wanted to spawn an enemy, um, I can say the following. Let's give it, let's copy and paste some of this stuff. So spawn an enemy. All right, now we're gonna give it a tag of enemy so I'm adding an enemy. I'm saying, uh, where is its position? Well, let's get a random position in the map. Now this won't be correct because you're gonna have to modify this. So float uh, enemy X, that is going to be equal to rand mod m window dot get size dot X, right? That's a random number between zero and the width. You know why that's not correct. Here's the Y, okie doke. Now this is gonna be EX and EY. And these enemies, you are going to have to set the speed of these enemies based on the config file, but I'm not going to do that right now. Um, the shape, 
I'm gonna give them a radius of 16 just to make them a bit smaller and I'm gonna make them all triangles and I am going to make them all blue, R, G, B. And they are going to have a white outline. All right, so let's do that. Let's see what this does. Oh, it doesn't do anything. Why doesn't it do anything? Well, I'm going to look down here to my rendering system. So where is my rendering system? Oh, look. Oops. In my rendering system, all I am doing is drawing the player's shape. Okay? So the player's shape is all that's happening in the rendering system. So what I'm going to have to do <laughs> eventually is the following. So I can say for auto E in M Entity Manager, entities dot get entities. So this is how I get access to all of my entities. This, if I mouse over, says this is an entity vector. So it's a vector of shared pointer of entities. And instead of just saying, hey, draw this player, what I'm going to do is draw all my entities. So for each of my entities, get that entity and draw the shape of that entity. Done. Uh, now, I may have to do something else, like I may want to say E, uh, circle shape. Actually, let's look, at, let's look up here. And we've got all this stuff that we did for our player. We're going to copy this inside. And instead of just doing it for the player, we are going to do it for the entity, for each entity. So I'm basically doing the rendering part for you but I just wanna show you what's going to happen here. So instead of only doing this for the player, you want to do it for each entity, right? So let's have a look at what happens now. Nothing's being drawn. Why is nothing being drawn? Uh, well, let's look over at the entity manager. The entity manager has a function called get entities. This is returning the entities. Uh, why is that not working in my rendering function? Uh-oh. So this is what happens when I do it live. Um, I have to make sure that I'm doing this correctly. Go back in here. Apologies for this. If someone can see where my error is, that would be great. Ah. <sighs> One second. We're going to test. Why is that not printing out? Oh, I'm so foolish. I haven't, we haven't done the entity manager yet. Apologies for the confusion. We haven't actually added stuff. Um, all right, so let me go back here. I'm going to let you do that because we haven't done some stuff in our entity manager yet. Uh, do, do, do. Someone said for auto, you can do this, but this should still work even if I haven't done this. But I do want to help debug this live because this is a good example. So I know I've gone a little bit over time for explaining the assignment, but again, I want to show you, like this is all optional live coding stuff for the assignment. All right, so let's go down we have, while running, we are doing the render. When I had that for the player, that was working proper, properly. So what I'm going to do every time I render, let's standard C out, M entities. This is good, this is good debugging. Dot get entities dot size. Okie doke. So the size of my entities vector is zero. Why is that zero? Well, let's go have a look at our entity manager. So as we said, the second thing that we have to do is implement the basic functionality of the entity manager class. Implement the entity managers, add entity and update functions so you can start testing the game class quickly. 
All right, so we'll look at Entity Manager, Add Entity. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. So in the Add Entity function, and remember, we went over this in the design of our Entity Manager class last time. What we did was we set up a new entity. This is done for you. We add that to the vector of entities that we eventually want to add, and then we return a reference to that entity. However, in the update function, apologies for the confusion, we haven't yet added that entity to the vector of all entities. So what we have to do here is we say for auto e in m to add, entities to add, right? So auto e in entities to add, I will say m entities. So this is all the vector dot pushback e. So that's the first thing that you have to do. For each entity in entities to add, add them to the vector of all entities and add them to the vector inside the map with the tag as the key. So what we do is we add it to the vector of all the entities. I'm not going to do this part for you, but I do want to do this part because then I will actually have access to my entities that I want to draw. There we go. Okay. Now I have the entities being drawn. So up here in my, where are we? Game class. Now I'm finally drawing all these things. I don't need to print this out. However, what I do want to do inside spawn enemy. All right, so I am spawning enemies. Let's say I just want to spawn an enemy at 100, 100, just to test to see if that works. Now, where is that enemy? Okay, I know something else that I've done, haven't done correctly. M entities to add clear. Here we go. All right, so I've got my player being drawn now correctly with the new code. I don't have my entity being drawn. Let's debug that together. I want to debug this with you because if I'm getting it wrong, then you're going to get it wrong. So inside my spawn enemy, oh, I haven't called the spawn enemy function. So inside my enemy spawner, yeah, here we go. My enemy spawner code doesn't call spawn enemy yet. So that's where this whole mess came from is that I'm not actually calling spawn enemy. So if I call spawn enemy here, then on every frame of the game, I'm going to be calling my spawn enemy function. And so just watch what's going to happen when that happens. Every frame of the game, 60 times per second, I'm spawning this enemy. That is not what I want to do, right? I want to call it every so many frames. So down here in my enemy spawner, do, 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 enemy spawner. What I can say is I have M current frame and M last enemy spawn time. And so instead of spawning something every frame, I wanna check to see if current frame minus spawn time. So for example, if I last spawn something on frame 100, then I want to wait until frame 200 to spawn the next thing. Okay, so that's what you would do this here. And then whenever you ca call uh, spawn enemy, you're going to record when you last spawned an enemy. All right. So again, sorry for the last couple of minutes of confusion, but I wanted to make sure that um, we debug that. So implement the basic functionality in the entity manager class. So you're going to do the add entity and update functions first. Add entity has been done for you in this way. And you have to do the thing right here where you, where you do this. Let's go back to the next thing you have to do. Implement the basics of a game class. So construct a player entity using the spawn player function. Implement basing drawing of entities using the render function. So we just did both of these things for you. Construct some enemies using the spawn enemy function. 
and construct a bullet using the spawn bullet function. So just start creating some stuff, okay? Then implement player movement in the user input function. So I want to go over that with you because that's very important. So right now, if I run the game, I disabled the enemy spawning. So I cannot move around in my game. I'm pressing and releasing some keys, but I haven't, I haven't attached that to any actual movement yet. So here's how we're going to do movement in our game. Let me open up the game class now that we're done with the Entity Manager class. Inside our event, so we have user input. The user input function is going to be inside this function. This is the user input system. You handle the user input there. Note that you should only be setting the player's input variables here. You should not be implementing the player's movement logic here. The movement system will read the variables that you set in this function. What the hell does that mean? Well, in here, I'm going to show you an example using up, okay? So when I press the W key, that's when I want my player to move up. So what I'm going to do is, well, right now I'm just printing out that I've got the W key pressed. So I'm going to say M player. That's my player. I have an input um, component on the player. And I'm going to say uh, the input components up variable. That is going to be equal to true. So you can see here, whenever I press the W key, I'm going to set moving up to true. Whenever I release the W key, I'm going to set moving up to false. Okay? So that's how that, that works. When I press a key, I set it to true. When I release a key, I set it to false. Now, what the other thing I need to do now is go to the movement system and actually implement for all of my entities, the movement. So here, I'm going to say implement player movement. How do I do that? Well, I can say if m player c input up is true. Well, let's say my speed is five, right? I can say m player. And now where do I find my velocity? Well, that's in the C transform. Now I can get my velocity and set the Y component equal to, let's just say negative five, okay? So again, up means Y is negative. So I'm going to set my Y velocity equal to negative five. Okay, so let me just try that. And then down here, I've updated. So I've said for the player, update the player's X position with the velocity. So take my velocity and update it, update the X and update the Y. Okay. So let's look. When I start the game, nothing is happening. When I press the W key now, my player starts moving up, but it, it's, it's still moving up. I can't, I can't release it. Why can't I release it? It's because I've set the player's velocity here, but I haven't deset it. Right? So actually, what I want to do is at the start of every frame, I can set the player's velocity equal to zero. So I'm setting the velocity equal to zero every frame. And then if up is being held, I'm setting it to negative five. So that way, if I release, it's not true and my velocity is zero. So watch, now I can move up by pressing or releasing. Okay, so the movement system is the thing that handles all the actual movement in the game. And the user input system only records the inputs because the user input system doesn't need to know how a movement is being implemented. And the movement system doesn't need to know anything about keys being pressed. All right, so just, just realize that. So that is the movement system. Um, that's... And then you would do that for every entity, right? So down here, currently it is only updating the velocity for the player, 
but of course you would take that and update every entity's velocity in the movement system. So that is the movement system. So construct some player, construct a player, you've done that. Basic drawing, we've done that. Construct some enemies, we've done that. Spawning a bullet, that's pretty easy. It's just like um, the spawning of the player. So in here, um, you've got spawn bullet somewhere. <laughs> Excuse me, I know there's a lot of code here. Where's spawn bullet? All right, so spawn bullet, okay? The bullet speed is given as a scalar value with respect to where the mouse position, or the bullet speed is in the config file. You must set the velocity by using the formula in the notes. So let's do just a quick example. I could say auto bullet equals m entities dot spawn dot add entity bullet and then give the bullet all the properties, right? So the bullet will be given a transform. It would start. So the position of the bullet is the position of the entity that spawned it, okay? So this is the entity of the position that spawned the bullet, or sorry, the entity that spawned the bullet. This is the target location that is the mouse position. So how do we do that? All right, so down here in the user input system, now we have mouse buttons being pressed. Okay, so the second part of user input, the first part was the keyboard, the second part was the mouse. So if I run this game now, and I click, I see where the mouse position is. See that? So let's do it um, so that I'm gonna spawn a bullet at the mouse position. Let's just do that and then you can um, do the rest for your actual assignment. So when I click, where is my spawn bullet? Okay, so auto bullet, it's the target that's gonna be passed in. That is going to be the actual location of the mouse click. So bullet, let's add a uh, C transform equals standard make shared C transform. The first thing is going to be position. So that is actually going to be the target. That's exactly where I want it to be. I'm going to give it a uh, velocity of zero just so it stays there for now and a rotation of zero. And I'm gonna give my bullet uh, shape. This is gonna be standard make shared C shape. And the constructor for a shape is a little bit complicated. So here it is. I'm going to give this um, a radius of 10 uh, points. That's going to be eight. This is going to be SF color, um, say 255, 255, 255. And the outline is going to be red. So we'll say SF color 255, zero, zero. And then the thickness of the outline is going to be two. And so that is the shape right? That is the shape of the bullet. And then that's it. So what else is going to happen? Well, whenever I click um, my mouse button, my left mouse button, I'm going to call spawn bullet. Well, it was spawned by the player and it was at vec2 and this is event.mousebutton.x and event.mousebutton.y. So Whenever I have a mouse button, if it's the left mouse button, print out where it was clicked, please remove this for your assignment, and then spawn a bullet at that location. So let's see what happens now. All right, so now my game is running. If I click somewhere, I spawn a bullet at that location. You see how easy this is? <laughs> with like, this is so crazy how I can so easily create things with this system. Now they haven't been given a a velocity yet or anything like that, but they are being drawn to the screen. They've been added to the entity manager. So it's so easy to do things with ECS that look, we're already doing this kind of stuff. It's kind of crazy how, how easy that is. All right, so that is the spawn bullet function. However, you have to do it so that it starts at the, at the player and travels towards the enemy. Implement player movement, we just did that. 
implement entity manager update so that it deletes dead entities. Okay, what does that mean? Well, over here in entity manager, one thing you have to do is that we want to remove and remove all the dead entities from the entity vector and remove all the dead entities from each of the map vectors, right? So we have this function, you have to do this. Essentially, for every entity in this vector whose alive is false, remove it from the vector. So you're going to say for auto E in vector, if E is active, if not that, then remove from vec. Now, this is a little bit tricky, but I'm going to leave that to you to do. So you have to implement this. There is something in C++ that you can look up that will make this a lot easier called standard remove if. Okay, so please go go do however you remove dead entities from that vector, you have to implement this function. And then you will have entities dying whenever they are removed. The next thing you should do is implement the get entities tag functionality. That is really, really easy. It's just like, okay, it's, it's this. <laughs> so entities, oh, sorry, entity map. There we go. That's it. Entity map tag done. Um, and then, sorry. The last thing we do is implement the collisions in our collision system. And that is right here. Where are we? Collisions. So in here is where you would say for each of our entities, okay, or for each of our bullets. So you can say for auto B in M entity man entities dot get entities bullet. So for each of our bullets, and then we can loop over for each of our enemy. Here is where you will decide whether or not the circle shape of the bullet is overlapping the circle shape of the entity. All right. So this is how you would do the collision using the math that we talked about in the previous lecture. And that I believe is the entire assignment. Uh, oh, sorry. And here's where you do your spawn special weapon. And here is where you implement the spawning of the smaller enemies. And that's it. I'm not going to do any of that for you because that's the majority of the hard part of the assignment. So I know I went, again, I always go over long, but I just want to show you so much code and have it there for you so you can have as much help as possible for the assignment. So um, that is assignment two. And I know it seems a bit long. It's a lot of programming. So make sure you get started on assignment two as soon as possible. You do have quite a bit of time to do it. You have 16 days, so you have more than two weeks to do that. And the setup is, it's already done for you because you should just be able to double click your solution file and just start running with it. The last thing I wanna talk about really quickly for the Linux and Mac people is for this assignment, I have created a make file. So before previously, what you had to do um, for Linux or Mac was you had to type out that long command in the, com in the command line. However, now all you're going to have to do is CD into your assignment directory and type make, as long as you have make installed. And I think um, build dash essential in Linux. So you like sudo apt get install build essential. That's how you get make. Okay. So executable binaries after you type make will be in the bin folder. So you could CD into bin and type SFML game in order to run it. However, it's annoying to change that directory every time. So what I've done for you is I've actually created it, created this make file. So if you type make run, it will compile your game and run it for you. Okay, let's see how that works real quick. Here is a supplementary crash course on make files. So 
in a makefile, you are essentially defining a bunch of variables and then calling commands based on those variables. So rather than having you just type out one really long command, what it does is it lets you sort of define a configuration for that. So the CXX, this is your compiler that you're gonna be using. Output is the name of the binary that we're gonna be producing. Here is a blank, currently blank variable. And for some people, especially those people running M1 Max, you have to specify manually where brew installed your SFML directory. So for Linux and Mac, you don't normally have to do this. But if you did have to do that thing for M1 Max, where it was like dash I slash user slash bin slash SFML, whatever that directory was, here is where you will put in that directory, but without the dash I. You're just specifying the directory, okay? Then we have the flags for our compiler. So the flags are where I am actually um, saying, okay, I wanna optimize, like set the optimization level, set the C++ standard. Here's the include. So these are the directories where all of our source code is. So the source code is in the SRC directory. And for those of you with the M1 Max who specified an SFML directory, it's also saying it's in that directory. Okay, so just specify that directory. Um, the LD flags, these are the linker flags. So again, for the M1 Mac people, that's there as well. All you have to do is type in your SFML directory once. Then it says, okay, here's where all the source files are. Here's how I will create all the object files. And then whenever I type make, what do I want to happen? Well, I want this output file to be created. It depends on the object files. So whenever I type make, it compiles all of the CPP files into object files using this command, and then it merges all of the, it links all of the object files together using this command. And so that's it. Like, it's just, I know it's a bit of a confusing syntax, but it's, a, it's essentially a build configuration script, right? Then down here, if I type make clean, it will remove all the intermediate build files, if you wanna do that. And typing make run will build and run the command, the, the solution for you. So this is a make file. It makes the, the Linux and Mac people's lives just a little bit easier. So I've included that for you in this assignment for that purpose. All right, that is it. Thank you so much for sticking around this long. I, I know you real, I, I'm gonna put timestamps and everything so you won't have to watch what you don't need to watch. But uh, thank you so much. That is assignment two. Um, it's quite a bit of work, so if you if you found assignment one a struggle and you did it yourself, please try and find a partner for assignment two. All right, I've taken up enough of your time. Thank you so much. Um, I'll see you in the next one.